and this comes from a deliberate methodical plan for choosing the person or persons who will read that deposition testimony to the decision maker into evidence when the deponent is unavailable. Now, some lawyers read the testimony themselves. Some have other lawyers in the organization or on the trial team, or perhaps paralegals or staff have them come into a courtroom or final hearing, and they'll play the part of the deponent. The lead lawyer asks the questions, and a colleague or coworker sits on the stand and reads the answers. And that can be fine. But you know that the mission of the 10,000 Depositions Later books and programs is to squeeze every ounce of value out of the deposition process and resulting testimony to enhance your chances of victory, which is to say, manage everything and leave nothing to chance. And who you choose to put on the stand in front of the trier of fact is another one of those opportunities that many lawyers miss. So today's message is this. Instead of just grabbing whoever's nearby and available, someone already on your litigation team or a coworker, consider consciously choosing someone specifically because their demeanor, presence, and ability to present and project will appeal to and help persuade your trier of fact. And this process includes determining who the trier of fact will be and what kind of demeanor or presentation of the deposition testimony will have the most powerful impact on the decision maker or decision makers. Now, if it's a judge or hearing officer, in other words, if there's no jury, you'll know in advance who's going to make the decision and you should have ample time to make a strategic reader or actor choice accordingly. If your case will be decided by a jury, on the other hand, you'll at least know on the first day who will be deciding your fate. So at that point, you can finalize your selection of an actor who can make a powerful connection to the jury. Presumably, if you know the geographic region from which the jury pool is drawn, you will at least have some idea who your ideal reader would be. Is it a rural jury, an urban jury? Are they mostly retirees, military, college students, government employees, or employees from the private sector? Most of these things can be assessed well ahead of the actual day of jury selection, so you can at least narrow down uh, the list of potential actors. And by actor, I mean the person who's going to play the part of the witness. Actor is an accurate, literal description. That's exactly what they're doing, acting. But as an aside, you may not know that there are organizations in the business of offering trained professional actors for hire to play the role of the reader or witness, which is to say, actual actors. Now, some litigators that have used one of the companies indeed have reported great success using a professional actor as a reader to present the testimony of an unavailable witness to a jury. There is no specific disclosure requirement for a deposition reader in a trial or final hearing in the federal rules or in any of the state court rules that we looked at other than at the time that they're about to read the testimony, at which point, of course, the judge will ask them to tell the jury their name. Most judges will then generally tell the jury that the person who's about to read the testimony is not the actual witness and instead will read the answers of the actual unavailable deponent. Anyway, trial lawyers that have used actual actors from one of these services have said that they were very satisfied with the impact of the professional reader. Now, we're not talking about actors coming into the courtroom dressed like Hamlet with a Salvador Dali-esque Manju mustache and O Fortuna playing in the background. We're simply talking about, in the case of the companies that offer trained actors to read deposition testimony, people who are professionals in the spoken word, professionally trained for pace, timing, and emphasis based on the substance of what's being said. The takeaway here is that the intentional and thoughtful selection of the reader, the actor, is another opportunity to turbocharge your trial presentation. Again, having an employee of your organization fill this role is probably just fine in many circumstances. 
There may be people in your organization that have a special gift of connecting with people from the way they present, from their demeanor. So even within your organization, you should give some thought about who can hit a home run when playing the role of the deponent in front of the judge, hearing officer, or jury. So that's the lesson for today. The selection of a reader isn't a ministerial offhand task when we're talking about advanced deposition strategies and techniques. It's an important decision and can help tip the balance for the trier of fact. A carefully selected reader brings the testimony to life, appeals to the decision maker, and connects the testimony to the outcome that you want. Now, as you know, I preach in all of my deposition related work that small advantages, micro advantages, alone or in combination with other tactics can tip the balance. That's one of the points that I've consistently made in the preface to each edition of the book upon which this podcast is based. One of the examples that I've given repeatedly involves some folks on Wall Street known as high frequency traders. In 2010, as you may recall, a trading group spent hundreds of millions of dollars to lay specialized communication equipment that in the end would shave about three milliseconds off the transmission time to buy and sell securities. Hundreds of millions of dollars to save three one thousandths of a second when it really matters. And once they finished installing that cable, they gained that advantage every day, many times a day. Micro advantages that when stacked up alone or with other kinds of micro advantages collectively become macro advantages. Same thing here. If you're using a live actor, again used generically, a reader, to read deposition testimony in place of a deponent, make it a conscious decision and choose someone who will really knock it out of the park for the jury. You know, I talked about a similar concept in episode 106 titled A Killer Option for Choosing Potent 30B6 Designees. In that episode, I talked about the tactic of some sophisticated litigants to use what is in effect a hired gun to come in as their 30B6 designee. And you know, if you represent an organization producing and preparing a designee, it's your call on who to produce. Often lawyers, again, choose someone who's typically a current or former employee of their client and who already has a great deal of knowledge about the topics that will be covered in the corporate representative deposition. But designees don't have to be a current or even former employee. It can be anyone designated by the entity. And so if the topic relates to patent infringement, for example, a corporation could, under the rules, track down the world's leading expert on patent infringement, hire them, prep them, and produce them. Now, what's the benefit of that? Well, that hired gun, so to speak, is much more likely to be fluid in answering both expected and unexpected questions. Because of their broad expertise, they'll have the ability to understand where the questions are coming from and are far less likely to be tricked or caught off guard. And I gave an example of that uh, in 106 in a real patent infringement case, the Sunbeam Corporation hired a professor who absorbed the material that was going to be covered in the deposition and testified as the company's 30B6 designee. What made that a superb strategy was that the professor was indeed the leading expert in the particular topics at hand. And so Sunbeam made a very savvy choice in using that strategy. Same principle here, where the rules don't restrict you in choosing the reader, you should be thinking about the incredible array of options that you have. The federal rules, and again, as far as we can tell, the state rules across the United States don't limit you in terms of who you choose as a reader. Now, do keep in mind that there may be, as always, local rules, local policies or procedures that affect your reader choice. But failing that, as in the case of choosing a 30B6 designee, you have very broad, almost unlimited discretion in choosing the person to be the reader. Maybe the perfect choice is someone soft-spoken. Maybe it's the opposite, somebody very outspoken. Maybe it's someone intellectual or vulnerable or sympathetic. Maybe a villain character someone slightly romantic or comedic. 
maybe somebody who comes across as completely ordinary. The question to ask is, which style best suits the testimony and my case and my client? So that's the point for today. Don't let this invaluable opportunity slip by. Make reader selection and management an active part of your deposition plan and program. I should mention that we've got quite a number of citations in the show notes today, including the web address for one company that offers professional actors to read deposition testimony into evidence. I'm not in any way endorsing the company. We're simply providing the link so that you can see what's out there. We've also included some articles and some court decisions that discuss this tactic. That includes decisions where one court addressed it in an offhand kind of way, denying the taxation of costs associated with a professional reader, where the deponent actually wound up testifying and the services of the reader weren't necessary. But in the process, the court made clear that it did not like the idea of a paid reader. Then we've included another decision in the show notes where the court dismissed it as something to be concerned about, in effect seeming to say, look, if a deponent can't appear in person, someone's going to have to read it and it's not going to be the deponent. But we found no decisions that say this is improper. And that makes sense, doesn't it? If the deponent isn't available and presuming it's not a video deposition, the transcript isn't going to read itself. And so this strategy of actively managing the reader choice is simply an opportunity to capitalize on the moment, which is what you do in every other respect in a contested proceeding. Now, are you squeamish about this? Does this sound kind of sketchy to you? I can see some lawyers being uncomfortable with this, perhaps viewing it as an untoward manipulation of the judge or jury especially if this is the first time that you've ever heard that there are lawyers that are actively managing reader selection, even to the point of hiring professional actors. Now, my role in teaching advanced deposition strategies and tactics is not to filter, not to make judgments about what I think is inappropriate, except where courts have uniformly and clearly said so. And we found no rules or judicial or other precedent uh, that say as a matter of law or ethics that this is improper. In fact, one of the links in the show notes is to an article on this topic that was published in a state bar organization's monthly magazine. So this tactic is not exactly being done in the dark. My goal is to always alert you to all of the strategies and tactics that are out there so that you can use the ones you are comfortable using and be prepared when someone else uses them. There are many entirely proper and very clever deposition tactics we see in use that are not widely known or obvious. It's why we write about them and cover them here to let you know what other lawyers are doing. I do suspect that some lawyers have never actively thought about whether an opponent's choice of reader was a carefully managed decision to influence the trier of fact. And indeed, in some of the material we cite in the show notes, it seemed clear that when a professional actor was being used, that the judges and the opposing lawyers did not realize it and did not inquire about the reader's background. So keep that in mind. Add this to your checklist of things to consider when choosing a reader for the deposition testimony in an evidentiary setting when the deponent is unavailable. Rather than just grabbing a warm body, consider using this micro advantage in conjunction with all your other advantages and techniques to pull out that victory. Professional actor or not, you will get better results when you proactively manage your reader selection. All right, a few practice tips and then we'll wrap up. Again, this should be part of your standard deposition checklist, which is to say methodically working through this issue. Ask which depositions in our case are most likely to be read to the trier of fact, judge, hearing officer, jury, in lieu of live testimony? And this includes depositions noticed and taken by someone else, where you need the testimony more than the party that caused the deposition to be taken. Often these depositions will be of experts, treating physicians, elderly witnesses, disabled witnesses, and those who, for one reason or another, are most likely to be unable to attend in person. 
Ask what are the issues in the case? What are the themes that you want to press to your decision maker? And who is the trier of fact? And what will they best respond to? Also, again, as we always point out, it's important to know the local rules in your jurisdiction and the particular preferences of your judge, hearing officer, or arbitrator. But begin considering uh, who the reader should be, the actor, once you identify those depositions that will most likely need to be read. What demeanor, what tone, what best to portray the testimony in a way that maximizes its benefit to you. Now, in most situations, uh, if there is a, a jury, the judge will instruct the jury that the reader is not the actual witness, that the witness was unavailable, but that the jury should treat the testimony as if the deponent said the exact same thing live on the stand. In fact, you'll want to ask for that specific instruction when you're at the point where you must, perhaps in a pretrial stip, where you need to identify the depositions or excerpts that are going to be read. If your particular kind of proceeding doesn't require advanced designation of deposition testimony, then consider whether it's important to ask the hearing officer or judge to give this instruction at the time that you offer the testimony. All right, uh, one last thought. For most lawyers, there are no alarm bells going off when a reader gets on the stand. In your cases, have you ever pressed for information about the identity and compensation of the actor or reader at that point? I ask that because in one of the articles cited in the show notes, a lawyer who used a professional actor with great success said that neither the judge nor the opposing lawyers had any idea that the reader was a paid actor. So it may be a good idea if an opponent is putting a reader on the stand to simply inquire before they begin about who they are and what they're being paid. All right, interesting stuff as always. Thank you so much and have a spectacular week. Now we do have some lengthy citations in the show notes today. And as you've heard me say, uh, many times, not all websites that host podcasts will display the entire show notes for each episode. They tend to clip show notes uh, after a certain number of words or characters. But you can always click through to our homepage and you'll find the complete set of notes for each episode. All right. Thank you once again. And we'll talk to you again soon.